You're listening to The Jay Barker Show on Tide 100.9 in Tuscaloosa. Show is presented by Haley Sansing, Union Home Mortgage. And welcome in just a gorgeous Wednesday afternoon. Appreciate uh, all the folks that have tuned us in both on our apps and uh, through our website and uh, through Tide 100.9, which you can receive all of the above. So, Lars, Justin Jones is our producer at our flagship, speaking of Tide 100.9. Justin, how are you today? Let's start with you. All good? Yeah, I'm... I'm whoops. I have the radio on here to listen to the show. I'm doing well, good. Well, and, and I caught you a, a little... I uh, caught you quick. Sorry about that. No, okay. no, all it's right. fine. Lars, what's up over there? Well, uh, I was on campus uh, yesterday and uh, spoke with, you know, faculty members, uh, students, and uh, I got to tell you, the word that Nick Saban uses a lot is the word I would use to describe the collective mood on the campus of the University of Alabama, and that is anxious, yep. anxious. I don't know if there has been more uncertainty about a Nick Saban coach team as there is at this very moment. And the confidence level, I would say, the collective confidence level, and this is just anecdotal evidence, right, based on the people that I interacted with yesterday, but the collective confidence level of, uh, of, of the people on campus is low. And uh, as, is as low, uh, I mean, when it comes to whether or not Alabama can win this game on Saturday, there is just, uh, there is not that feeling of invincibility that you always get, right, from from fans that, you know, uh, hey, Nick Saban, they're going to figure out a way. And, and it's just, you know, just based on the last two performances by this team, that uh, it just has, you know, uh, it, it has put a big uh, dent in, in uh, the, again, the confidence level of, uh, that fans have in this team. And so um, this is a, uh, we keep saying that, hey, this is the biggest game in Saban era. This is the biggest game in Saban era, you know, and with the uh, caveats, right? But uh, th- th- this is a huge game. I think we are going to learn more about, we're going to finally get the definitive answer on Saturday of where this team is going. If, well, if they, especially at, at quarterback, yeah. and I think that Alabama's going to have to rely a lot on their defense, and I, I think that's something that we haven't put the microscope on because that defense played great against uh, South Florida, and they actually played okay against Texas. It's a, offense didn't help them out at all. So, yeah, I would say this is the least confident fan base I have ever seen under Nick Saban. I don't really even think there's a second. There's, it's not a close second anyway. And offensive line may have more pressure than Jalen Milrow because uh, they are really under the, under the microscope. So, yeah, it's a huge game. But I'm going put to put one on you that it's not even rumored anymore. People are putting it out there as a rumor, okay? But uh, I've questioned since the game why Melrose didn't play against South Florida. Yeah, you have. Do you have a reason? Because I've heard I, one. I do not. Okay. I've, I've heard that there's a chance that he was suspended for something away from the field because I've wondered why he didn't play. And if I'm spreading a rumor that isn't, a, that isn't true, then I will certainly take that. But all of that adds up given how – he did not play in a situation that I thought he would have come in after Buckner did not succeed. And the other thing is, is that uh, Saban put a lot on him, and you saw it. Milro was very active on the sideline to support yes. this team. And uh, that those two don't make a hill of beans, really, but it is kind of the way I've been leaning here because it just never made sense as to why he didn't play. So... I don't know what he did, and I'm not going to spread it anymore. I, I, I don't know, and I hope, Lars, I have, I'm not going over the top here. But you can hear exactly what you're talking about uh, on, on this radio station. 
Yeah. Uh, on Tide 100.9. The callers are throwing stuff overboard, you know? I've never heard the fan and Alabama fans have been pretty quick to criticize and instead, you know, fans are supposed to pretty much be, you know, they're cheerleader, cheerleader. Okay, we're the fans, and that's the word, fanatical in a good way. But uh, they haven't been really since the Texas loss, and then the way Alabama played at Tampa um, has magnified the situation. And, um, again, uh, full circle, back to you, Lars, and then this is the biggest game Saban's ever faced. Agree? Yeah. Yeah, in in the regular season, I mean, it's certainly uh, against an, an opponent like Ole Miss. Um, you know, yesterday the uh, there was player availability to the media, and player after player um, commented on the high character of uh, of Jalen Milrow. And uh, you know, I, I thought it was really interesting how Saban phrased it on Monday that that Jalen had quote unquote earned the title of starting quarterback after not playing. Well, what did he do? I mean, he he demonstrated leadership from the sideline, right? By, by being a a, a raw, raw, engaged, uh, encouraging, uh, very reminiscent of, uh, of Jalen Hurts when uh, Jalen Hurts was benched in the second half of the national championship game. Um, You know, but uh, you know, Ja'Cory Brooks, he's, he commented on how uh, Jalen Milrow has really been uh, since the spring, been focusing on becoming a leader. Um, uh, Senator Seth McLaughlin, he noted that uh, after, uh, or he said this, I think earlier in the season, like after week one, that, that Jalen Milrow's car is typically parked next to Saban's in the morning, which shows that he's like the second person in the facility after Saban. And, uh, and, you know, it was just, uh, just player after player was really uh, just singing the praises of, of Jalen and how he has acquitted himself and, and how he took to not playing last week. And, um, you know, it, and, uh, you know, it, he is, he, he, he just, he gives Alabama the best chance to win. And I get that he has deficiencies, right, uh, in in the passing game. But he can throw a beautiful deep ball. He's he's accurate throwing the deep ball. It has been the the intermediate stuff that has uh, caused some problems. And I think there are certain ways that Tommy Reese and Nick Saban. I, I guarantee you, Nick Saban is going to be more involved in the offense and the uh, this week. And also sort of setting up uh, what they want to do on offense than he has in a long time. And you got to remember that Nick Saban is a former uh, <laughs> a quarterback, right? He played played at a high level in college or sorry, excuse me, a high level in high school. And, you know, he's the son of a coach and uh, he very much sees things through the quarterback's eyes and. I've talked to so many people over the years, Matt, and I've, I've, I've noted this several times that that uh, coaches have told me that Nick Saban could easily be known as an offensive genius if he had played offense in college, right? Or if he had started as an offensive coach. Instead, he started uh, as a defensive coach coming out of uh, uh, Kent State after he played uh, defensive back there. So I, I think Nick Saban's going to be heavily involved in, in, in developing the play call sheet. They got to sit down with Jalen Milrow before uh, they'll probably do this on, on Thursday. Uh, and, and hey, it's the first and 10 at the 20. What play do you like? Uh, second and three at the opponent's uh, 35. What play do you like? And just go over the list of plays that that Jalen feels most comfortable with, and and try to get him uh, confident early with some easy throws, uh, you know, maybe some some uh, rollouts, uh, RPOs. Uh, I, I I mentioned yesterday that uh, the RPO percentage of plays that are RPOs that Alabama is running this year is about. 10% less than it was uh, just uh, two years ago. And uh, they just have to devise a play script and a game plan that suits his strength. 
And I know that sounds simple or it sounds like a simple concept, but you know, when you've been working on certain things for a long time, it's hard just to shift away from that. But uh, I, I think they, that it, it, this is going to be a true test for, for Tommy Reese. And, uh, and, 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 you know, can he pass it, right? Can he come up? Can he be like a, a Lane Kiffin? Can he be uh, a Steve Sarkeesian? Can he be a Bill O'Brien? Like, this is really a big, big moment for Tommy Reese, who so true. far, who so far has absolutely looked overmatched and out of place and we've seen the 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 images of him in the press bar in the coach's box just looking absolutely utterly perplexed and wanting to pull his hair out but uh this is this is his moment this is his moment and the season depends on it we're going to continue this thread and also remind you at the bottom of the hour with very special guest Anna Slive Harwood will be with us to talk about the Blue Shoe Ball and Mike Slive and all of their efforts they put forward to stomping out prostate cancer. So, you're listening to Big Noon Sports. Keep tuned. Lee Thompson is known as the Bama Broker. She's a Tuscaloosa native, an Alabama graduate, and the only realtor in town with Wall Street experience. A skilled negotiator, Laura Lee knows how to buy low and sell high. And the Bama Broker isn't just going to show you houses. No, Laura Lee is going to educate you on the market, guide you to homes that fit your budget, and teach you how to sell your home for its maximum profit. Throughout the entire process, the Bama Broker will equip you with the tools you need to both buy a home and build financial wealth through home ownership. Trust me, the Bama Broker, who's as roll tied as houndstooth, will get you across the goal line. That's Laura Lee Thompson, the Bama Broker with Advantage Realty Group. You can reach her at 205 790 7229. Again, that's 205 790 7229. And you can also email her at Laura Lee at the Bama Broker.com. That's Laura Lee at the Bama Broker.com. Tide 100.9, Tuscaloosa weather. A warm afternoon, the sky mostly sunny, the high 85. Fair tonight, the low 62. Tomorrow, partially sunny with a high at 86. And for Friday and Saturday, a good supply of sunshine both days. Highs between 84 and 87. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 84 degrees in Tuscaloosa. From T-Town to the Plains. This is Alabama's most in-depth analysis on the SEC. This is Big Noon Sports. Our show is being brought to you by, presented by Haley Sansing Union Home Mortgage. I uh, want to remind you of our uh, dates later on this week, Friday. We will be at and it's free and that's been a lot of fun um laura lee thompson the bama broker joins us and we cut up have fun with the students and um and the adults and uh, y'all can come by and have a cold beer while we eat so it's a it's a wonderful thing to do we will be live there every friday football every football friday i should say from now to the end of the year and hopefully that'll be uh 15 games total but right now as Lars and I were talking about in our first segment of Big Noon Sports that doesn't seem very likely and um, having gotten whooped by Texas now Alabama helped them but uh, Texas was a better team that night I don't think anybody could argue with that but now you got Ole Miss a team that first of all has Lane Kiffin who uh, just he'd probably rather beat Nick Saban than anybody else in the country although he has great respect for him but um, you have that situation, and then they're at home again. And I don't remember Saban losing two home games in a row. Now, technically, they're not in a row. The games at home are in a row. The I, it's it's never scheduled. happened. It's yeah, never, that's never happened. happened at Alabama. And, uh, but, you know, let's break the game down a little bit. Does Dart present problems that Alabama has had in the past with quarterbacks? 
Well, I'll, I'll flip it right back to you. What, what do you think? Because I, I, I'm glad you brought this up because I, I really wanted to get your um, analysis here midweek about your expectations. Let's just let's just start with Alabama. Your expectations for how they will play, right? Like you you want to believe that, it, that it's finally going to come together, but the evidence we have seen through the last eight quarters, it just doesn't give you a lot of reason to believe that it will. Now, is it possible the fact that the quarterback issue has been resolved, right? It's been resolved. The the the, the cake is finally out of the oven, right? Or the cook or whatever uh, metaphor analogy Nick Saban was using. Uh, the, the cake has been that baked. Yeah, the cake has been baked and the cake has been served to Jalen Milrow. He's the guy. And do you no, think he's the, the actually he's the cake? Is he the cake in this or does he get to eat know. the cake? Um, yeah, <laughs> well, he could have his cake and eat it, too. If he'll just yeah, play yeah. Well. that's right. That's right. Um, does that help? The fact that, that there is clarity now of who the quarterback of this team is. And also, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, it, it was J.C. Latham yesterday came out and it was saying he feels like that he's let Jalen down and, and the offensive line has let him down and and the supporting cast has let him down. The wide receivers, tight ends. I mean, everybody, they feel like it wasn't just Jalen Milrow that, that, you know, struggled against Texas. It was it was everybody. Okay, so just all that being said, do you think Alabama comes out and just shocks us all by putting forth a a uh, a a game that uh, is back to the Alabama of of the of of the of, of, of a dominating Alabama team that we have come to expect? I don't think so. To be honest with you, I mean, have we seen a lot of proof except for game one? Um, I, I think that Alabama will ultimately win this game. It'd be nice if they could uh, put a couple of touchdowns on the board in the first quarter and then not cruise, but then keep that lead throughout the game. But I just haven't seen enough from Alabama to make them think that they're going to go out there and punch Ole Miss in the mouth. I also think that Ole Miss puts a big old crimson target on this one and they want to win bad. And um, Dart is, he's a heck of a quarterback, and they'll have a heck of an offense. But defensively, I think Alabama's defense is going to say to themselves, all right, after three games, this is a picture. We yeah. are the, we got to carry this team. And you, you remember the Alabama defenses in the past? going back to the Bryant years through the Saban years that literally could carry a team. What was the year? It was about uh, seven or eight years ago that Alabama's defense was averaging scoring a touchdown a game. Um, this defense is capable of putting up those kind of numbers. So I, I think, and many people have mentioned it, um, they go back a little bit to the Stallings era and they play for field position and they play back to their defense. And if, if they win 20 to 10, you better be good with it because uh, that's what's going to happen. I really expect the defense to step up once again. Yeah, um, I do too. Defense, running game, Jill Milrow, take care of the ball. Cannot throw any picks. And especially the kind of back-breaking interceptions that he threw against Texas, which ultimately... I think were the, the 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 two key plays of the game. Um, so ESPN uh, is uh, and and Bill Connolly, he does a, a really good job. I respect Bill very much, and and he does projections, and he has his uh, it's called SP Plus model that he uses to predict scores, and he predicts Alabama winning thirty five thirty two. And uh, you got to remember, last year Alabama at in Oxford won thirty to twenty four, and uh, and the line opened uh, in Vegas uh, largely in favor of Alabama, but uh, I think it's moved now down to seven and a half. I think it opened at like eleven point eleven and a half 
I think it's seven and a half. I, I could be wrong on what it opened at, but I believe it, it's seven and a half in favor of Alabama right now. And uh, uh, man, I, 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 I'm with you. I mean, this is, this is a monumental game for this team. And if they can come out and play well and get the win, you know, their season is right back on track because uh, Ole Miss is a very, very good, very, very good offensive team. I think they still can be had on defense. Uh, how many points does Alabama need to score? I think Bill Connolly has it about right. They need to score in the in the range of 35 points, and I certainly think they can. Um, but also, Matt, if Lane Kiffin is ever going to beat Nick Saban, don't you think this is the year? Yeah. Uh, you know, he almost beat him with Bryce Young last year. And Ole Miss really feels like they should have won that game in Oxford. So, yeah, they're going to come in there with that in their rearview mirror and then looking forward to this is an Alabama team. Hey, if you were any team on Alabama's schedule, would you not want to play them right now? Yeah, <laughs> you absolutely. You probably go back 15 years and ask the question. And they'd all say, I, I want to play them Saturday. So, yeah, I think this is, is a big opportunity. And, and what a win it would be for Ole Miss. It would certainly um, put them in the lead to win the West. Not saying that they will. I'm, I'm still pretty much thinking that it's uh, going to be LSU. Or, and you know what? I, I guess I'm really a half glass full guy because I, I really think that uh, while Alabama uh, has struggled and there are more problems to fix than I've ever seen in the history of Alabama football under Nick Saban, but I think they're reparable. And uh, I think a lot of people are throwing the, the baby out with the bathwater when I think this team can if they can get a kind of a solid win over Ole Miss and move forward, then I think they've got a chance to accomplish a lot of things they did five weeks ago. What are you going to be looking at right away? Offensive line. I mean, Me too. I was, was going to say that exact same yeah. thing. Well, I mean, Offensive but, line. Are they getting, are they blowing guys off the ball? Are they protecting Jalen? Are they getting the proper snap from center? You know, although I don't guess that was as big an issue versus South Florida, was it? Now, in retrospect, um, but yeah, it's it's the O line, and you know, I think right behind that, we're all uh, waiting with great anticipation to see if there's a little bit more RPO, and if uh, they're going to have more of an offense that's uh, developed for the talents possessed by Milrow. Yeah. And uh, and I'm also interested in the play calling. Uh, interested in True. just er early on, especially what are they going to do to get a quarterback's confidence back? Who the last time we saw him was walking off the field with his head down against Texas, right? And uh, and then being benched for whatever reason, he was benched uh, last week, and so now to go from the, the low of being benched to the high of knowing that you are the starter and you're the starter moving forward um, because it's you're, you're 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 the best option Alabama's got i mean it's pretty pretty obvious at least it is to me i mean i know you still i i, I think ty simpson it can definitely be in the mix maybe even later in the year but certainly next year if he chooses not to transfer but uh you know with the 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 stud recruit coming in there may julian be an, saying. yeah with I'm julian saying yeah and he was just uh raised to a, a five star and uh and you know he's playing lights out uh right now out in california in, in his senior year of high school and he'll be at Alabama before we know it, right? He'll, uh, I believe he's arriving in January. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, if, uh, if both Buckner and, and Simpson transfer, but uh, that, that's really not a, a, a germane subject for right now. Right now, all that matters is, can Jalen play well on Saturday? And I think, you, you know, remember how Nick Saban used to say, any possession that ends in a kick is a good possession. 
whether it's punt, field goal, PAT. And I think they got to kind of get back to that mentality or Jalen needs to play with that mentality. Just, it, it, it's okay. It's okay to, to take a sack. You know, don't force the ball into coverage. Uh, and just to, you know, just they got to simplify things, make it a simple offense, and, and you can make it work. I mean, you, you really can, and, and especially if you utilize his, his skill set. And that is basically having uh, another running back back there. And you can really put stress on the defense uh, by uh, with your play calling by utilizing his unique skill set. I mean, I would, I think you can make the argument based on what we've seen so far. He's the best running quarterback that Nick Saban's had at Alabama. Um, my initial thought is you're right. Wouldn't it just be great if Dart dropped back to pass on the first play of the game and he threw a Kool-Aid pick six? The roof would come off (laughs) Bryant Denny Stadium. And then to see Alabama return to the Alabama we've seen in the past. I want him. Hey, I, I, I want him to come out in the wishbone. Let's yeah, th- let's I have it. Let's have a reincarnation, right? Of uh, of Bear Bryant going out to USC, and it's a big secret. And Alabama starts in the bone, right? Boy. Coming out. I would love that. It even if it's be. just well, even if it's just one play, wouldn't that be great? I would love to see it. I would love to see it. All right, you're listening to Big Noon Sports. We'll be right back. Securing the best mortgage possible requires a lender who has knowledge, is trustworthy, and treats customers like family. And no one is better at all of this than the mortgage miracle worker, Haley Sansing. Based right here in Tuscaloosa, Haley Sansing has spent decades working in the mortgage industry. With Haley, it's personal, holding your hand from contract to close. With Haley, it's about one thing, you. Call Haley on her cell, yes, her cell, 205-792-1813. That's 205-792-1813. Let Haley help you. NLMS number 230376. Hey, this is Reagan, owner of R&R Cigars, the Cigar Mansion in downtown Tuscaloosa. Located at 2703 6th Street across from the Home Two Suites. Come down to R&R and see why we're the ultimate cigar and bourbon experience. With over 165 bourbons and five private barrels, our selection of bourbon is unmatched. We have the best cocktails around and our cigar selection is legendary. Our lounge and service are world class. Come and experience the luxury of the mansion and see why it's a world-renowned cigar and spirits destination. More Big Noon Sports coming up. Matt Coulter, along with Lars Anderson, Justin Jones is our producer, and our guest is Anna Slive Harwood. This is the daughter of Mike Slive, um, a man that Lars and I knew personally and um, had a great affection for. Um, he was just a tremendous man on, off the field, father, son, brother, what, whatever role he was in, he did it well, and, and he did it with great integrity. Uh, Anna, thank you for joining us. Uh, unfortunately, it's probably been about a year since we've talked to you, but how have you been? Oh, well, thanks for having me on, and we're doing great. I can't believe we're back here in September again. Tell us about your, your best and your annual fundraiser that's coming up. Yeah, thanks. Um, we're going to be at Regents Field this Friday night. We're changing up the venue, changing up the event a little bit, but the cause and the importance of it remains the same. Um, so we are, we're doing the Blue Shoe Ball this year. So it's a black tie event with dancing and an auction and great food and drink and all the usual trappings that we have. And um, we are, you know, trying to raise money for prostate cancer. Uh, we fund cutting edge research and we also try to develop programs to educate men about the importance of getting that PSA test every year if they're over 40. Um, and I know we've, we've talked about this before, but you know, prostate cancer affects one in eight men. And it, that's the same number as breast cancer in women. 
And this is one of those things that, you know, I think if my dad were alive and we're talking to you guys, he would say, why wouldn't you get checked, you know, as a man? Why wouldn't you get that test early? It's a simple blood test, takes five minutes at your doctor's office, and it can save your life. Anna, I, um, one, it's great to talk to you and hear your voice. It's been way too long. Uh, but uh, I see that the, the, the Mike's Live Foundation uh, has raised in the neighborhood of four million total, right? Since you uh, since you began, and uh, and how do you decide where that money goes? Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, I think it's pretty remarkable what our board and volunteers have been able to do in just six short years. You know, I was sending someone some photos of the inaugural event we had uh, back in September of 2017, just this morning. And, you know, that was the only event we had for the foundation that my dad actually attended when we launched it. And um, then, you know, he passed away in May of 18. But I think he would be just overwhelmed by what we have been able to do in such a short time frame. We have we went from nothing that first fall when we opened our doors and said, here we are to, like you said, raising over $4 million. With that money, we have funded 27 prostate cancer research grants. And we have also developed programming to educate men and reach out, especially in the Southeast, you know, Alabama, Mississippi, there are so many communities where black men who are disproportionately affected by prostate cancer live, who don't have access to even that basic care. And they're just these, you know, they, they talk about food deserts. Well, there's health deserts too, where we're trying to reach men and make sure that they can get a test, but not only that, they can get the follow-up care needed if that test result is not good. So that's what we do when people make a donation to the Mike Sly Foundation. We fund research to try to find a cure and better treatments for prostate cancer. And we fund educational programming like our block cancer program and other things where we're reaching out into the community and making sure men know the facts about prostate cancer and reminding them to get checked. Because, I mean, guys, let's be honest. Sometimes it's the woman that reminds the man that it's time to get checked. You know, we get our tests every year, but sometimes you guys need a little nudge. So that's what we do. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people have a, a certain thought in their head about the tests and so forth, but it's PSA now. I mean, I'm, I, I get checked. Lars, you're getting checked. And uh, I, I don't understand. And I actually have a couple of friends that don't. I just go, you know, really? Somebody drop a dumbbell on your head but more people are getting <laughs> tested than ever and it's from efforts like yours that do so so if i'm just of the want to suddenly want to join in this event what do i do well that's uh, great thank you we just go to the mike's live foundation website which is mike's live foundation.org and there's a link there where you can get your tickets you can purchase a sponsorship um, and you can take a look at all of the amazing auction items that we have, you know, obviously with my dad's connections in the college sports world, um, we have a lot of friends that donate some pretty incredible things from tickets to Wimbledon to the national championship to the SEC championship and the Iron Bowl. So, you know, there are things for non-sports fans as well, but if you're a sports fan and you want to donate to a great cause, the auction is an awesome way to do it. Anna, uh, shifting gears for a second, uh, you obviously had a, a front row seat to the relationship that your dad had with um, uh, Greg Sankey. And can you just uh, tell us sort of what you saw? And, I, and you know, whenever I was with Mike, um, it seemed like Greg was either in the next room or joining in in the conversation we were having. Uh, just uh, just the influence that your dad had on him and and how do you think your dad would, uh, what would he say about Greg today as, as, as in his performance as, uh, as your dad's successor as the SEC commissioner? You know, I, I don't think a lot of people realize that my father hired Greg like that fall that he got the job back in 2002 and Greg was by his side for his entire tenure at the SEC. My, uh, Greg was one of the first people my father brought in. Um, I think 
I think they're very like-minded in terms of their ability to analyze uh, very challenging situations and very uh, democratically and diplomatically handle those. You know, I think Greg is a very soft-spoken person, but like my father carries a big stick when he's in the room and Greg's knowledge of the inner workings of intercollegiate athletics is, is just absolutely tremendous. And they both shared a passion and share a passion for the student athlete and doing what's best for the student athlete and protecting the institution and, and protecting, you know, all of intercollegiate athletics. Clearly Greg has had to navigate some challenges that perhaps even my father couldn't have imagined um, but I, I think if he were here today, he would be, you know, I don't mean to sound pejorative, but he would be so proud, um, almost in a parental way, of what Greg has done and how he has not just led the SEC, but, but tried to be a leader on the national scene for intercollegiate athletics because there's been so much change at the commissioner level. You know, the, the people that have known me my whole life that I grew up around, a lot of them have retired, you know, with the exception of, I think, Greg and maybe Mike Oresco. It's a lot of new faces at the commissioner level at that table. And um, and it's a whole different world for college athletics right now. So um, I think he I think he would have been very proud of what Greg has done. I'm not sure there's any easy answers to some of these harder problems that that we're facing right now in college athletics. So. I think he would be extremely proud. In fact, I, I think he is because uh, when you have a man in sport like your dad in Commissioner Slive, you expect the next guy, there's kind of be a little bit of a slip, but there wasn't. And uh, I still marvel when I watch him speak and, and address the media or address fans. Um, he has a very light demeanor. Uh, you know what? To be honest with you, Anna, that makes me really comfortable. Because he has a little, yeah, he has you know, the ability to take the room, but he has the ability to do it softly, and and every once in a while he'll throw a piece of humor in there that'll just bust your chops. Yeah, that's the one thing. A lot of if you don't know Greg, he has a wicked sense of humor, and it's it, it's it's really funny. But I I do think, you know, to take that role on and to do that job day in and day out. It's unrelenting, especially now. And it even was when my dad was there. I mean, you know, and you, you have to have that calm demeanor that both of them had. And you have to have the ability to see the big picture at all times and not get caught up in the minutia of the day to day. My dad used to say that his job was to handle tomorrow because his staff was handling today. And I always love that. It, it fit him, but it also fits Greg very, very well. And Anna, um, I can't believe how uh, long it's been since we lost your dad in, in May of 2018. Just, uh, and, and, and you know how I personally felt about your dad. Um, on a person, just for you, what are some of the life lessons that you still think about that he imparted to, to you, his daughter? That's probably one of my favorite questions you could ask me because I'm I'm in the middle of trying to impart them on our daughter. My husband and I have an 11 year old who is quickly becoming a teenager, and I know that my influence will start waning very soon. You know, the thing about my father more than anything else is the golden rule: treat everybody with kindness and respect. Treat everybody the way you would like to be treated. And, you know, Lars, when you think about your relationship with him, when you think about the media and how much he would not just remember your name, but he'd remember your wife's name and your kid's name. And if somebody was sick, he would ask about the family. For him, it was always about people. And I always, you know, I think about my dad's smile and how that smile could just light up a room, especially when my daughter walked in it. But I really believe that that was the single most important thing that both my parents taught me, but my father, um, he just, he was kind and he taught it to me, but he also emulated it in everything that he did. And the other thing I think that he did that was just beyond anything that we see now is he had a work ethic that it's hard to match these days. You know, people forget that when my father started at the SEC in, in 2002, he was already 62 years old. 
most people are looking to retire and ride off into the sunset at that point. And he was he was just getting started. But you can ask any of his staff if you're hard pressed to beat him in the office in the morning. I mean, he worked 24 seven because he always said, when you do what you love, you don't work a day in your life. Yeah, you know, I, and I, I'll, I'll never forget. Uh, I didn't know your dad very well. Uh, and then he, he summoned me to his office. Right. Of course, I go and he wanted me to sign a book. And he wanted to talk about book writing. I mean, he was he was he yeah. was legitimately interested in my life. It wasn't like he was faking it. And there there is such an right. authentic, authenticity uh, to him that uh, is so rare for someone who uh, you know at the time was the most powerful man in all of college sports. Well, and I think too in this day and age when people are the world is full of you know, misinformation and fake news and things like that. My father always taught me that the only thing you ever really have that you have full control over is your integrity and your reputation. And to be honest and to be kind to people, it doesn't cost you anything. And I think, you know, you look around the world, we've had a rough few years as a, as a world and as a people and kindness is free. And he knew that. And you're right. When he sat down with you, it was genuine. He wanted to know all about you and he wanted to, he wanted, it, it's what made him so good at what he did is he could bring a room together like nobody could. Yeah, and um, he was the most popular guy I've ever seen around the media, too. And uh, that yeah. <laughs> may be the most difficult test. Uh, Anna, you can go to your father's website. Tell everybody how they can get in touch with you about Blue Shoe. Sure. Mike's Live Foundation.org. It's this Friday night, 6.30 at Regent's Field, and everything is online. So bid on those auction items and help us end prostate cancer. Let's do it. Thank you, Anna. Great talking, Thank Anna. Thank you guys so much. Great to you talk bet. to you, too. Indeed. Hey. That ought to be a fun event. Oh, put yeah. Lars, put Lars in a black tie. Let's see how he can dance. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, um, some movement in light of the Nick Chubb injury on Monday Night Football involves a former Alabama running back. We'll talk about that. Maybe dive a little deeper into the National Football League. Coming up, Coming up. on The Game with Ryan Fowler. Coming up on the Wednesday edition of the game, we'll feature Brett Norsworthy. We'll feature Bo Bounds. We'll feature Josh from collegefootballnerds.com. That and a lot more as we continue the Dreamland Score Prediction Contest right here on the game starting at 2 o'clock on Tide 100.9, the home of Alabama Crimson Tide Sports. The longest-running sports program in Tuscaloosa. The game with Ryan Fowler. Weekdays from 2 to 6 p.m. on Tide 100.9 and streaming on the Tide 100.9 app. Tide 100.9, Tuscaloosa weather. A warm afternoon, the sky mostly sunny, the high 85. Fair tonight, the low 62. Tomorrow, partially sunny with a high at 86. And for Friday and Saturday, a good supply of sunshine both days. Highs between 84 and 87. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 85 degrees in Tuscaloosa. This is the Big Noon Sports Network. Hey, back on Big News Sports, it's Matt, Lawrence, Justin. Hey, want to remind you how you can win 30K. Yeah, that's three zero comma zero zero zero. $30,000. Um, remember the code is 631-631 and go to the app and enter that code. And who knows, you might be in a luxury suite this weekend purchased by yourself. <laughs> you might be headed to Italy or something of the like. So remember, the code is 631. Go to the app and enter. Lars, um, Jerome Ford is often referred to as a former Alabama running back. Technically, he he is or was. You know, I'll let you decide what the tense is. But I don't immediately, he doesn't immediately come to mind. But anyway, he comes to mind as a running back played at Cincinnati that Alabama beat in the playoffs, but uh, he is he is an NFL running back, and uh, he has made his name there, and he's now the guy in Cleveland. 
because Nick Chubb went down. He's out for the year. But now, Lars, I see that they have also re-signed or bringing back Kareem Hunt. There are no Nick Chubb, but I think those are adequate replacements. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, man, you look at when, uh, <laughs> when uh, um, uh, Ford was at Alabama. All right, in, in 2013, the running backs in front of them were Damian Harris, Najee Harris, Josh Jacobs, Brian Robinson. It's a, <laughs> it's a pretty deep running What's back the room. What's guy supposed to do? 20, 2019, <laughs> Najee Harris, Brian Robinson, <laughs> and Jerome Ford. And uh, it was just tough for him to get on the field, so you, you can't. You, you, you really can't uh, complain about him him transferring, and it worked out well. Worked out really well because he was able to showcase exactly what he was capable of doing when he was at Cincinnati, and uh, the Browns uh, picked him in the fifth round last year, and um, you know he performed really well on Monday night after Chubb went down, uh, 106 yards on 16 carries including that uh, really nice 69-yard run where it, it went to the right. There was absolutely nothing there, and he kind of bounced around and went all the way around the, the left edge and uh, just barely got tripped up, I think, at like the one-yard line. And uh, But it was uh, – He's, he's, he's a special talent, and uh, you, just, you just hate what happened, though, to, to Nick Chubb. And you go back and, and you look at it, and it was just uh, – I don't know, Matt. Like, was it a dirty play by by Mika Fitzpatrick? Uh, I, I just, I hate. I wouldn't. I, there's no way. There is absolutely no way that this was intentional by Mika no, Fitzpatrick. No. He, he's a he's a good good young man, uh, a great character. There's no way that this guy would go out and intentionally hurt somebody. Um, the, the thing is with Chubb. It's like in your mind, at least I'm thinking, in your mind as a, as a defensive back, you're like, the only way I'm going to get this dude down is to go low, right? And uh, because you're not going to get him high, you're not going to get him in his thighs, you got to go low uh, to get him to the ground. And the problem was that he was already kind of going to the ground. Yeah. And it, 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 it looked bad. Right from uh, for Fitzpatrick, like it, it didn't. It, it it looked like he was going right at his knees, but I did, I know there, there's just no doubt in my mind, knowing the character of Mika Fitzpatrick, that that this was not an intentional move by him. But what what did, I know you had a chance now to really look at it, Matt. Like what what did you think about that play? I can understand why people thought. Um, it could have been an illegal tackle. Um, but I take all of the things that you just mentioned into measure, and I know he didn't do it on purpose. Uh, but, some, you know, sometimes you don't pass in a fear. Sometimes you don't grab a, a face mask on purpose, but it's a penalty. And Minka, in addition to this, Lars, and I, th I think it goes hand in hand with the compliments you were, you were talking about, Fitzpatrick, but he has one of the highest football IQs I've ever been around. Yeah, um, and he is his IQ said this is the only way I'm gonna get him down, you know. Um, so that that's my thoughts on it. Um, but I've always really really liked Minka Fitzpatrick, and uh, I think so. But I don't know if I've read enough about it and keep up with the NFL like you do, Lars. But is there a lot of pushback and criticism of Minka Fitzpatrick? I know in Cleveland there will be. But yeah. just from the national pundits, is there? Yeah, because a lot of a lot of former players are coming out over social media and just and blasting him. Um, you know, uh, and, and Kyle Brandt, uh, who I really like, he he co-hosts the morning show on the NFL Network. Good Morning Football. Um, he's he's excellent. He is just an ex excellent uh, analyst host, and he's funny. And uh, he, uh, he said that, uh, hey, I'm texting with some people that played in the league. Uh, he said that the Mika hit is dirty. He should be fine. He should be suspended. Uh, he went low when Chubb was vulnerable. 
and uh, in uh, uh, Jason McCourty, who's a co-host on, on that show and a former defensive back, he actually disagreed. He said, I don't think it was an intentionally dirty hit. When you look at the replay and you see him going low while someone is tackling him high, you're like, well, why would he do that? And, and then uh, he continued to say, you have to remember, defensive backs are the smallest guys out there on the field a lot of times. The way you, and this is just the point I was making, the way you get a big back down is you have to go low. If you're Mika Fitzpatrick, you can't tackle Nick Chubb up high because he's going to run right through you. And, um, and you know, it's just, uh, it's just really too bad that, uh, that Chubb is, is going to miss the entire, the rest of the season. Um, and, and also, uh, he, uh, uh, Fitzpatrick got hurt later in the game. And he had to go to the hospital because he was the one that dove and got Jerome Ford down at the one yard line after that 69 yard touchdown run. And he, he injured his, his chest. And so he is, uh, they don't know if he's going to be back this week or not, but I, I, I'm inclined to go with, uh, with what uh, Jason McCourty said on, uh, on good morning football, which by the way, I, I watch it. I watch that show every morning. It is so good, Matt. They have such great chemistry on that show. It's uh it, it, it is. It's just a lot of fun. A lot of fun to watch. Um, what is it again? I have to write it, it, it down. I'm it's 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 Good Morning Football on NFL Network, and uh, it's, uh, it's it's McCourty. It's uh, 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 gosh, Kyle Brandt, uh, Peter Schrager, and the. Uh, the one used to have the Jacksonville State DB Eric Davis on. Uh, um, anyway, uh, I don't get the NFL network. Um, so yeah, I'll, and, I'll be uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and Jamie and ja- Jamie and Jamie Erdahl, uh is sort of the the host of it, and she does a great job of kind of acting as a point guard. And man, Jamie knows her stuff, and she had just replaced uh, she replaced Kay Adams, who is now doing other things. And Kay Adams is a huge uh, Bengals fan, for what it's worth, but. Uh, it's a great show. I love it. Hey, coming up next hour, we'll talk to Steve Irvine, who is now with uh, Magic City NIL, associated with UAB to a certain extent. Uh, he and Tim Stevens have developed that, and he's going to join us. To talk about some college football. Talk about uh, ooh, what happened to UAB. Um, also, Lars, I'm surprised you didn't tell me about this new this uh, new idea and event and place that Sports Illustrated has come up. This kind of surprised me. It made me wonder why others hadn't done it in the past. We'll talk about that on the other side of the break. You're listening to Big Noon Sports. It's the Tide 100.9 30K Workday Payday. Win cash every weekday, 8 to 5. Here's this hour's cash code. 182. Again, that's 182. The code is 182. Enter that code now on the Tide 100.9 app. Click on the 30K payday button and enter the code for a chance to win $30,000. Covering SEC sports like Kudzu on the roadside. This is Big Noon Sports. I just have to love how the weather has changed. It's still, still maybe 80 degrees, but the humidity is down. There's a breeze, and there's uh, no doubt that football is in the air. And, and in fact, the uh, end of summer is coming up in just a couple of days. So, anyway... Lars, I don't know if you saw this story on AL.com, but I read it with great interest because I think it's kind of cool. And that's that Sports Illustrated is developing some sports resorts. They're uh, themed in line with Sports Illustrated. There's a hotel, a restaurant, pool, and a very sports-oriented lifestyle. So where do you think they're going to build the first one? Where else? (laughs) Town, USA. They're building this resort, and 
this is a perfect spot. If you've ever been to the Cypress Inn, and I'm assuming this is what we're talking about, they're going to build it across from the campus over the Black Warrior River, and I think that would be somewhere in the vicinity of the Cypress Inn. But that's just a great idea. And to me, though, Lars, it seems like maybe an ESPN or something maybe of that like would have started them. But I think Sports Illustrated is um, way ahead of the curve on this one and bringing it in, and they're going to do it. They'll start it in Tuscaloosa, and I think they have their designs on maybe 25 more, and they're all college towns. So you're, <laughs> when you open something like that in a college town, a Tuscaloosa or Auburn, you're automatically going to draw a lot of students. And uh, I think this is a great idea, and I'm quite certain that you'll have us there for the grand opening. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't think there's a single editor still at SI from, from when I worked there for 20 years. Um, it, no it's, a, it's amazing how, uh, man, I, I can't even like access my own stories that I wrote for the magazine um, unless I were to become a subscriber, but there's nothing to subscribe to. Uh, because, hey, because, uh, because of Bama uh, uh, or uh, uh, Chris Walsh's site, uh, um, Bama Central, is, you can read all that for free, and that's really all I'm concerned with. But, um, yeah, th- th- this is an interesting concept. Right. Okay. So, the, the, as you mentioned, the first resort is going to be built in Tuscaloosa on the northern side of the uh, Black Warrior River at uh, Rice Mine Loop. Going to open in late 2025. It's going to have a full service hotel, condominiums, vacation ownership club, uh, SI uh, health and wellness center, restaurants, and entertainment. And uh, so the uh, and this is a part of uh, uh, it's a it's a hot it's a, a sports hospitality ventures uh, that that is helping SI with this and and according to the CEO it's like the, he said that uh, the SI resorts are all about hospitality lifestyle leisure and entertainment while we celebrate not only the legacy of Sports Illustrated, hey, that means that I, I should have like free passes to these things since I worked at SI for a long time. Uh, That's what I'm but saying. yeah, yes, uh, but we're gonna they're gonna immerse our we're gonna immerse our guests in sports culture, providing the best entertainment, cuisine, fitness, health, and wellness. Uh, people are seeking different experiences that allow them to become more active and participatory. And SI resorts are going to deliver the ultimate experience for guests through the hospitality destinations we are creating. So, um, yeah, this will this will be interesting. Um, there was a uh, um, there was an SI resorts property that opened in the uh, DR, uh, the Dominican Republic. Uh, back in 2022, and it was used as a location for the uh, the uh, swimsuit shoot, uh, photo shoot for the 2023 uh, SI swimsuit issue. And this resort has golf, sport fishing, scuba diving, snorkeling, horseback riding, water sports, zip lining, biking, hiking. Uh, and then there's another resort that's going to open in Orlando and in Tuscaloosa. So um, I think, you know, this is a way for, uh, Sports Illustrated is struggling, right? Uh, to, to, to stay relevant, stay afloat. But the thing that SI has that no other, no other uh, 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 brand in media, in sports media has, is this rich history that goes back to 1954, right? And 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 if you can somehow capture that history and that nostalgia, and put it into a resort, uh, you could possibly you know reintroduce younger people to these uh, these stories that w- from 54, 55, you know, 60s and 70s, 80s. These these stories, which are, are is some of the best uh, journalism and best writing that uh, that we've ever seen in this country. I mean, I, I, and that's not an overstatement. You know, we got, uh, Hemingway wrote for Sports Illustrated. Uh, 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 George Plimpton and uh, just uh, Frank DeFord and all, all these literary Lars titans. Anderson. Lars Anderson. Yeah, there you go. Um, 
I think that's the first time anyone has ever mentioned me within about 10 seconds of Hemingway. But um, no, I, I think this is a great idea. I do. And, I, and I'm rooting for them. You know, I, I don't agree with what uh, the new owners of uh, Sports Illustrated have done to uh, the magazine and, and to what they cover now and, and the, the garbage that they put up on their website. Uh, but, you know, I, I, this is a pretty cool idea. Uh, I agree. What do you think? Uh, yeah. I, and where do you think uh, sports people that come in from out of town are probably going to go now? Um, I don't know. If, if game day comes to town, do the Sports Illustrated uh, restaurant owners uh, offer them a place to come sit and have dinner? Of course they do. Uh, whether or not they go is totally different things because I guess that in some way they are in competition. But you hit on something that kind of wanted to talk about for just a minute here and that's the brand of sports illustrated quite honestly lars i would have thought it would die it out about 20 years ago by the time you left but how has it remained as a, a very popular i mean it's a very popular magazine but i don't see many people carrying around under their arms as they go to breakfast no. Uh, how have they kept the Sports Illustrated brand alive when the print media is going down the hole? Well, it's on life support <laughs> and it's doing things like this. And uh, um, I know that their, their website is still pretty popular. Um, they put up a paywall for most of their uh, national stories. And, you know, I, I'm not really interested in in that uh in, in in paying for that but uh yeah I, you know it, it's been a struggle i mean it, how they've survived they, they let go of everybody <laughs> i mean they, they got rid of uh the, the overhead there's no there's not even a, a physical office anymore in manhattan we used to have three floors on the time and life oh building my, that's so sad karen it, it, just wrote me a note that said it keeps alive through the swimsuit edition and she's actually it, not it, off base she's, she is not off base at all um yeah uh, not off base at all it's like uh um i miss the old one though lars golly yeah Man, it, it, it used to be I was a kid uh, the best christmas one of the best christmas presents i ever got was a year-long subscription to sports illustrated yeah you know, i'll talk to my students about sports illustrated and it, it means the brand means nothing to them yeah, really sad yeah <laughs> yeah well, it is you need to hold class at the new si resort that's right and i'll they need uh, to pay you <laughs> yes a lot of money <laughs> at least pay for the students and your cold beer so right. um Wow, we hadn't talked to UAB football uh, since right after the season began. We need to do that. And also Steve Irvine covers college football as well. We'll get his thoughts when we get back as you listen to Big Noon Sports. Presented by Haley Sansing, Union Home Mortgage. Football. Tide 100.9, Tuscaloosa weather. A warm afternoon, the sky mostly sunny, the high 85. Fair tonight, the low 62. Tomorrow, partially sunny with a high at 86. And for Friday and Saturday, a good supply of sunshine both days. Highs between 84 and 87. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 84 degrees in Tuscaloosa. The best sports talk in Alabama. This is Big Noon Sports. As we uh, continue on this Wednesday afternoon, and I was uh, trying to balance or spin a couple of plates here, uh, I'll just have to ask Justin on air: Is uh, is our man Steve Irvine up? He's ready to go. All right, let's just bring him in that very awkward way. Steve, it's Matt and Lars, Justin, the gang. How are you today? Doing great. How about you guys? Um. Hey, it's football. It's football weather. It feels great. But uh, let's start with the fastball. What in the world happened at Regions? Uh, excuse me, not Regions. That's the ball field. Um, yeah. And perspective uh, uh, this weekend. Uh, I was listening to the game Saturday night because it got so delayed. But, um, man, uh, UAB just got tomahawk. 
Yeah, yeah, they just, um, you know, it's hard, it's hard to say what happened. I really, I mean, I, you know, I think what happened, sim- kind of simply put, is they got whipped up front. You know, I think that they, um, they just got out physical uh, by, by Louisiana that, uh, and just really didn't have an answer to that, you know, and, and, you know, I was surprised by that because that's not something that I figured would happen in that game. And, um, so they've got a lot of, Answers or questions to answer this week, and a lot of soul searching, and um, and you know, and then it doesn't get any. Again, it gets a lot tougher where where they're headed. So um, it was bad timing to play like that, but uh, you know, it, it is what it is. Yeah, they're heading over to Athens to play Georgia um, at Sanford Stadium. Is there any way, any way, for UAB to keep this close? Uh, now is Georgia going to be there? <laughs> <laughs> if Georgia shows up, I, I you know I just don't think so because I and I think just part of it is I just think what Georgia's just uh, you know if they if they got out physical by Louisiana, you know what's Georgia going to do? You know I, I think uh, now I do think this I I do think UAB is going to play better than they did last week. I really do. I think that they. That's kind of you sort of refocused and, re- and changed some things, maybe it's a, or the way they approach things. And so I do think I don't think they're gonna, you know, embarrass themselves. I mean, I think they'll play hard, and and but I, you know, they just I, I just don't think I don't see it uh, you know, at this point staying close. And uh, you just you just never know unless Georgia comes out and turns the ball all you know turns the ball over a bunch and makes a bunch of mistakes and you know maybe for a little bit. But uh, I just I don't see it in this game. Well, I th- kind of saw it last year, and then Georgia just absolutely clocked them. So, and, and jo- while Georgia yeah. doesn't look fine tuned, they are still Georgia, and um, they are big, strong, rough, tough. Carson Beck's really starting to show his signs. So, you know, you always hope for the best, but uh, in this case, my expectations for UAB are not very hard. Uh, other than up front, where is the problem? We uh, Zena looks okay. Uh, are there other problems we're not aware of? Well, uh, turnovers. I mean, and, and and a lot of that's on Zeno. I mean, Zeno's played well. There's no doubt he's played well, but he's also made made some you know, mistakes in winning the turnovers. You know, he threw a, an interception in the, in the end zone last week, and you, know, you can't do that. And not in win games, you can't do that. And um, you know, I, I think that um, they, I think they're just still trying to find their way a little bit. You know, I, I, they they there's they've got talent there, and and you know, I think that the coaching staffs good and all that stuff they're just trying to find their way a little bit and and they're turning the ball over you know and 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 and, and often turn them all over at really bad times i don't think there's ever a good time for a turnover but you know they got they got to get that fixed and they've got to run the ball i think the other thing offensively at least is um they haven't been able to run the ball with any consistency at all and they you know they got a really really good a uh, really good backfield i mean they've got a lot of good uh, running backs and they just hadn't been able to to uh, to get that going and and, and you know defensively they, they they've struggled I mean they've um, and a lot of it has been the play up front and a lot of it is I think last week is going to help from a lot of the guys that they that they've been counting on the the returners that they you know kind of wanted to lead this thing have struggled and and that last week might be a little um, refocusing for those guys and and uh, you know moving forward moving forward now it'd be a lot better. If they could play, you know, North Carolina A and T again this week instead of Georgia, you know, that would that would kind of help you answer some questions. But uh, you know, schedule says go over there, so they go over there. Uh, so on on Saturday, uh, scoreless first quarter, UAB and Louisiana, and then the game gets delayed an hour and fifty one minutes due to weather, and then. Second quarter, Louisiana comes out after the delay and scores 24 points, and basically the yeah. game is over. I, did, did Trent talk about you know just the impact that the weather delay had, or or and in your mind, did it have an impact? Uh, and or is it just sort of it, was it inevitable that Louisiana was going to you know lay a good one to UAB? Yeah, I mean, I think in the first quarter before the, the delay, uh, you could see some things happening with UAB that they just weren't playing well and, and some things happened. But I think a key to this thing was, you know, Louisiana's quarterback, starting quarterback went down in the first quarter and they, 
they brought in another kid who it was a little it was a lot different you know he was more of a running quarterback as opposed to the other guy was kind of a a, a dual threat but not near near the runners that, that the second guy they brought in was and and I think that the delay for them you know they had two hours to change things you know say okay well we got you know and and, and the kid that got hurt was going to be out for the whole game I mean I think he broke uh, I think an ankle or, or, or something but so he was out and um uh, so I think they had a chance to kind of go, okay, you know, we're going to change it. Here's what we're going to do now going forward. And I think they came out ready, you know, came out with that plan. And I'm not sure that UAB did a good job of adjusting to that. I mean, I, I think that was part of it. I, I think there was, um, you know, it just kind of a, one of those things, you, you know, you never wanted to delay, but if you're going to have one, if you're Louisiana, that was a pretty good time to do it. And so I think that was part of it. And, and I, I don't know. I just think that, 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 uh, even once they got back out there, even when you're not talking about planning, once UAB got punched in the mouth, they just didn't really respond, you know, and, and, and that was, uh, to me, that's probably, uh, I, that's disappointing, you know, because, because you would think they, uh, you, you would want them to respond and I don't think they did. And, and it just kind of snowballed from there. And every time UAB would, would have a, you know, an opportunity to maybe crawl back in if they'd make a mistake, whether it be an, a turnover. Or, you know, stupid penalty or just, you know, just things like that. So it was, hey, it was one of those nights and, uh, you know, got they got to move forward now. Uh, in a little over two weeks, UAB plays, here's the irony, the South Florida Bulls uh, in Birmingham yeah. at Protective Stadium. Uh, my yeah. point being, this schedule with the American Conference, totally different than Conference USA. And if UAB stumbling out of the gate, well, after Georgia, they got Tulane, South Florida, yeah. uh, USTA, UTSA, then Memphis. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They're going to have to straighten this thing out in a hurry. And I, I think a lot of people be interested to see what South Florida and uh, UAB do. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, the thing is, you know, they asked for this. They wanted, to, you know, they wanted a tougher, a better conference, and then they got it. You know, and, and in, in conference USA, you know, every year. You could, you could, you know, you wouldn't say it publicly necessarily, but you could look at a, a, a schedule and go, okay, well, you know, that week we can, you know, we can get right. You know, if, if we, if we, if we're struggling that week, we can get right. And, you know, you look at the schedule now and there's really nothing out. There's nothing left on there. Uh, and there's nothing under schedule where you can say that, you know, it's going to be tough every week. And so they've got to figure it out on the fly. And I think that's part of the reason this week during practice, and and during their preparation for Georgia, sure, yeah, their preparation they are preparing for Georgia. There's no doubt, but really the theme has been let's 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 figure out who we are. Let's figure out what you know. Let's take care of us, you know, type of thing. So in a way, even though this is a tough game to to bounce back from, in a way it might be an okay you know, okay deal because you know you don't you're not going to go in there and win that game for you know more than likely you're not going to so. You have a chance to say, okay, let's just take care of us. Let's figure out what's going on with us. And I think there's been a lot of uh, a lot of focus on on that this week. Well, uh, sticking with South Florida, what uh, was your big picture assessment of what uh, what went down between Alabama and South Florida on Saturday? Uh, that was crazy, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I didn't expect that. Uh, I think in the long run. That might have been the best thing could have happened as far as focusing, you know, fo- focusing the team. Because it's one thing, you know, you lose to Texas, you know, a, you know, a good team that, that really is a, you know, really is a toss up coming in the game. And I don't know that you, I don't know that you stare in the mirror as much, uh, when, after a game like that than you do when you struggle against a team like South Florida, who you, who you should dominate. No, I don't care who's playing quarterback. You should dominate that game. And so, I think in a way that might be a, uh, you know, in hindsight, when you look at the end of the season, you might look back in that week and go, hey, that was a big week to, to refocus this thing and get this thing back on, on the tracks a little bit. And, uh, you know, and, and the, you know, the, the weird thing, I mean, just the whole quarterback thing. And I don't know, you know, I don't know, I don't know if anything's come out yet or, or not about Mil- Milrow, but I just can't imagine he was either healthy. Or, uh, or, you know, not healthy or suspended or whatever it may be. You know, you, you hear some things, but that was just bizarre to me that in that situation that, that you don't put him in, in, unless that was your plan going into the season going, 
okay, well, we're going to have Milrose going to take the Texas game and, and have his opportunity, and then we'll see what those other two do in a game that we think we're going to win by a lot. And, you know, of course, it didn't work out that way, but um, they won, but they didn't work it a lot. But it was a bizarre it was a bizarre game. But, again, I think it could be a great lesson. Well, let's talk a little bit about Auburn because uh, they put in a lot of RPO. I think Alabama's going to do the same thing. But I'll be very honest with you, Steve. I, I did not think that um, Thorne, Peyton Thorne, was an RPO guy. But he had 126 yard rushing last week. Yeah, and I think he's one of those sneaky guys. You know, guys that you don't think can can do that. And, and I, I do think that when you put in good RPO plays, a lot of times you don't have to be a great rushing quarterback because it's so well designed. And I think that's one thing that that uh, Hugh Freeze has done over his career. You know, and, and hey, he's had some great runners, but he's also had some guys that weren't great runners that 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 look pretty good running the football in his design. And I think that's kind of what they do. Well, you know, I, I do wonder, you know, I do wonder what they're going to do with Robbie Ashford and, 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 you know, moving forward. And, and I still think that, that, you know, when you're this, when you're four weeks into it or, you know, going into four weeks into it and you're still kind of unsettled there, really, at least publicly, um, that, that, that would worry me, you know, when, when especially going into the, to the, the teeth of this thing, man. When you when you go into your SEC West or SEC schedule, and you're and you're not totally in tune to what you want to do, that's not a good recipe. So you know we'll we'll see moving forward what happens with that. But uh, you know I, I don't know. I still think that they're um, not quite there yet. Yeah, um, this is going to be a really interesting game going on the road to Texas A and M. Uh, you just look at Auburn, you know, of the two teams, there's only one that's undefeated, uh, unbelievably, and it, it, it's Auburn. They're 3-0, they're and o, balanced offensive attack, and granted, the level of competition hasn't been great, other than the fact they took the longest road trip, I believe, in school history and, and beat Cal, <laughs> right? They beat Cal on the road. And yeah. this is a really, it's an important game for Auburn. I mean, it's a measuring stick game. It's crazy too the, the parallel between what Auburn is facing this week and Alabama. Like for I think we're these are uh, I, I referred to them yesterday as, as a true serum games. We're we're going to find out the truth yeah. about both of these teams on Saturday. But for Auburn, man, after A and M, their their schedule just gets brutal, and then they got you know dates against Georgia, Ole Miss, LSU. And you got to remember, A and M, uh, for all the great recruits they have on defense, they gave up 48 points against Miami. And right. uh, yeah, they responded with a 47-3 win over UL Monroe. And uh, Connor Wegman is a, is a really good quarterback for A and M. But uh, do you see a uh, a chance here for uh, Auburn to win this game? Oh, I, I, yeah, I definitely see a chance. I mean, they're going to have to handle, you know, handle, you know, life on the road. I mean, you know, they're going to have to handle some things, you know, and, and, uh, but I know, I think they, they certainly have a chance. You know, I, with, with Texas A&M, I still think you can outcoach them, you know, and, and I, I don't know, you know, I just, I don't know. I don't believe fully in their, their, their whole staff and, and, uh, you know, so so I mean, I think there's some things that you know, if if, if Auburn can can devise a, a game plan, a, you know, really good game plan and execute it well and don't make mistakes and handle things, I think it's a chance. You know, uh, but but again, when I mean, you talk about the recruits, I think Texas A and M, if they put it together you know, together, then they they could be pretty darn good. Uh, it's just a matter of will they, you know, and that's a question with them every year under Jim O Fisher, especially is. You just never know when they're going to put it together, and uh, and and so if they come out and put it together this week, then I don't think Auburn has much of a chance. But if they struggle and Auburn does things well and has a good game plan, then yeah, it's possible. Hey, can you hang through the break? Yeah, sounds good. I appreciate. It. I've got a question to ask you about another team in, in this state that we don't often talk about. Maybe we should be. You're listening to Big Noon Sports, presented by Haley Sansing Union Home Mortgage. for 
championships. Rose intercepted Alabama. Built by Bama. Alabama is still Alabama. The Crimson Tide play here. Join us Saturday as the Crimson Tide kick off SEC play against Ole Miss. Our coverage begins at 1130 on your home for Alabama football. Brought to you by Birmingham Racecourse. BirminghamRacecourse.com. You can be a winner too. T-Town to the Plains. This is Alabama's most in-depth analysis on the SEC. This is Big Noon Sports. Your Wednesday afternoon coming at you. Our home ship is tied 100.9 in Tuscaloosa. Thank you to all the participants there, particularly our producer, Justin Jones. Here's a name I'm not sure a lot of people even in the state of Alabama would have recognized uh, until uh, this past weekend. Kane Womack. He is the head coach at South Alabama. And he took his Jaguars to Oklahoma State. And he didn't just win. He banged them around a little bit. 33-7, I believe, was the final. Hey, (laughs) Steve, what did you think about that? Well, it was, I mean, it's obviously surprising, but, but really, you know, Oklahoma State was playing three quarterbacks and kind of know they were a little, uh, you know, out of sorts going in. And, and South Alabama, Kane Womack, is, is, he is, he is quietly built, uh, built a pretty good program there now. You know, they went to UCLA last year and, and should have beat UCLA, basically gave up a, you know, a late touchdown and final minute touchdown of, of uh, you probably would you know should have won that game, won 10, 10 regular season games, tied for the uh, for the division title with 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 Troy, but it lost to Troy last year. So they were coming off a really good year and 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 re- returned a lot of guys. Now they returned, I think, on offense they might have had 10, 10 of eleven back, um, and some of those guys weren't even starting because of some of the portal guys they brought in. So he's really built. Uh, you know, a, a, a nice, a nice team over there, a nice program over there. Carter Bradley, quarterback, is really good. He's a transfer portal guy last year from one of the MAC schools. I don't know, maybe Toledo. I'm not sure. One of the MAC schools, and and uh, you know, they got a stable of running backs. So Damian Webb was a great high school player here in the state of Alabama. It's really good, um, very good defensively. So really. Yes, by name, you know, you look at it and go, wow, that's a big shock. But if you really look closely at who they are, they're pretty good. Now, they got beat pretty good at at, uh, at Tulane to, to start the season. But uh, but I think responded really well to that. And, uh, you know, they, they, I mean, they he's got it going on. Now, I don't know how long they can keep him there, uh, but hopefully a while. You know, hopefully he'll stay. But, I, you know, it's hard to say whether, whether they can or not. But. But I think they've got the right guy in there, and I've been waiting for that program to kind because of, the recruiting base down there is tremendous. Uh, they've really done a great job of getting their their uh, facilities in order now, and they've got really nice facilities. So I think it's uh, you know it was a diamond in the rough all along, and I think it's um, you know it, you're starting to see it now. Steve, uh, switching back to Alabama, um, Nick Saban was uh, on the uh, SEC uh, media conference call a couple hours ago, and he was asked about Tommy Reese, and his uh, his quote was, uh, it, it's everybody's responsibility to try to get it right and find a better way. We're all working together offensively. I think we're making progress. I think the most important thing is we trust and believe in our players. We've got to be positive in our approach to how we try to help them have more success on the field. So I, I, I was, I'm was i just seeing this you know, as I read it for the first time. And uh, I was mentioning to Matt earlier in the show that I think Nick Saban is going to be as involved in the makeup and creation of the offensive game plan this week as he's been in a long, long time. Uh, and and it kind of sounds like it from this quote. Again, like uh, I think the uh, the important part of it is the we're all working together offensively. And, you know, fans, media members, we're all sort of clamoring like, hey, why can't you just tailor this offense to the strengths of Jalen Milrow and don't have him drop back to pass on uh, third and five on second and five and third and five and stay in the pocket and try to hit 
a 12 yard out route, right? That this is not his, right. his strength. So what would you like to see out of this Alabama offense on Saturday against uh, Ole Miss and, and what is shaping up to be a, just a, a critically important game for Alabama? Yeah, I, I, it absolutely it is. I, I think the first thing I'd like to see offensively is is build it around Milrow and, 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 and his strengths. And his strengths are not like you said, they're not dropping back in on second and five and third and five. They're they're you know, they're they're going and being an athlete and to me you build it around him first. You know, especially when you don't you know, when when you don't you, you haven't had a great play offensive line right now. I mean I think there's some good pieces there. I really do. I still think there's good pieces there. Uh, but they haven't played that well. And, and so I, I think you build it, you figure out what his strengths are, and that's your that's your base. That's where you go from. You go from, okay, here's what his strengths are, and his strengths are being an athlete. You know, right now, that's his strength. His strength right now is not being a quarterback, is being an athlete. You know, and and uh and I and I do think he's I do think he throws the ball better than than sometimes we give him credit for and that type of stuff. But I do think the first thing that, that, you know, if I'm a defensive coordinator against him, the first thing I worry about is him with the ball in his hands. I mean, that, that's just what, you know, that's what, that's what I'd worry about. And so that's to me what you, what you begin with. You begin with, okay, we're going to, we're going to get some, you know, some quarterback runs and we're going to, we're going to devise these quarterback runs that, uh, that are going to use his strength. And, and, and again, I mean, I've said this before and I was just sort of, I was sort of kidding a little bit, but, I, I would do things quick with him, and if this if something's not there, then you go, you go, you go make a play, you know. So you almost you look at, you know, I've said, you know, kind of kidding, saying, hey, you look at your first read, and if it's not there, then you go. But in a way, that's kind of what I'd like to see. You know, I'd like to see him make quick decision or, or make a quick decision whether it's there or not, and if it's not there, you go be an athlete. And so I think that would be where I would start, and and just you know build from from there. Hey, before we let you go, talk a little bit more uh, about your new project with Tim Stevens. It's, uh, I guess, under the umbrella, S-A-N-I-L, and then locally in, in Birmingham and in Alabama, the Magic City Impact. Uh, tell us what y'all do and how folks can follow you. Yeah, what, what it is, it's really, it's kind of a unique thing that was uh, started by Sunil and, and, and Tim Stevens was the one that kind of built the idea a little bit, and it's... Uh, Basically, we're we're under the arm or work with the athletic department with their um, with their collective, with their NIL collective, and, and just trying to basically what, what we're trying to do is you know Tim and myself are you know tell these stories, tell the stories of these of the players and the coaches and the and the, the program. I mean, I think the one thing with uh, with Alabama with uh, with UAB is you know the story is, has been so poorly told for a lot of years now because because just because you know they just hadn't had a lot of people that have um really done a good job of kind of telling the story of it and and, and you know hopefully you know what, what we hope is by telling the story it'll it'll help build their their nil their collective uh to to bring it up to uh, not only bring it up to the to, to standards of you know bigger schools but schools that are similar to them i think that you know that's one thing that they've struggled a little bit with just kind of kind of getting the word out so that's what that's what we we, we're doing and it's been uh we've had a great reaction it's been two weeks now had a great reaction and and uh you know our work can be seen at magiccityimpact.com and and uh and and also on there is just different ways to uh contribute to the nil and the program and just uh you know kind of find out the you know a lot about the uh um the uh the senile and just different things good we'll follow Appreciate it very much, Steve Irvine. We'll talk again, I'm certain, next week. Sounds good. Appreciate you guys. All right. Thank you, Steve. Much talk about Ole Miss visiting Alabama this weekend, and we'll hear from Ole Miss's Lane Kiffin in just a couple of minutes. Go inside the Alabama Crimson Tide with the Gary Harris Show. Hey, it's Gary Harris. Thursday morning on the Gary Harris Show at 9 a.m. on Tide 100.9 FM. The coach, Ellis Johnson, the Falcons report with D. Orlando Ledbetter and my pal Jeff Spiegel. We'll be talking a ton of ball on Thursday's Gary Harris Show at 9 a.m. Catch the Gary Harris Show Monday through Friday, 9 to 11 a.m. on Tide 100.9 and Tide100.9.com. Looking for... 
Tide 100.9, Tuscaloosa weather. A warm afternoon, the sky mostly sunny, the high 85. Fair tonight, the low 62. Tomorrow, partially sunny with a high at 86. And for Friday and Saturday, a good supply of sunshine both days. Highs between 84 and 87. I'm James Spann on the ABC 3340 Weather Center on Tide 100.9. It's 86 degrees in Tuscaloosa. From T-Town to the Plains. This is Alabama's most in-depth analysis on the SEC. This is Big Noon Sports. I don't know. I'm so... We got so much work to do on this game. Um, I, I don't know. That one's well documented. Um, I just really respect him so much, and I think as you, you know, continue to mature, grow, and get older... Um, and as a head coach, you know, you, you realize how much a head coach has to deal with, even though I'd been one before, and all the, the issues with players and coaches, and then, you know, to be at the top as long as he, he was and see how consistent he was. And we'd have games, we'd blow people out. And that's him. I mean, Western Kentucky, we're blowing him out, and he's losing his mind on me like, you know, we're losing to Auburn or something. So that, that that's him. And... That's why he's so good, because he's so consistent. It's Lane Kiffin talking about uh, his former head coach, that being Nick Saban. I also um, read a quote about Nick Saban. Obviously, they had their SEC media meeting, uh, their their phone conferences this morning, but also um, saw where Nick was stepping up and talking about what a good defensive, uh, what a good coach, head coach, Deion Sanders had become. But... Um, there are a lot of connections with Nick Saban, former assistants, and Lane Kiffin is one. And don't you know, he is just golly chomping to get his first win over his former coach, Larry. Yeah, he is. And uh, if not now, when? Right? And um, <laughs> I don't know if you believe uh, some Alabama fans, it'll be next year, too. Um, it's it's pretty funny though. Like if you when you see Lane Kiffin speak, he uh, has adopted a lot of Nick Saban's mannerisms. I mean, I don't know if he's doing it just out of because uh, it's 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 Alabama week, but it's like it's crazy. If you uh, if you just look at the at the body and how he moves his hands, it's as if uh, it's uh, Nick Saban and Maybe it's um, maturity. Yeah. So, and and also Nick Saban on the uh, the uh, his conference call today with the uh, the SEC conference call, he did give us an update on the status of Alabama's quarterback cake, and uh, this is what he said. He said, "I think the cake's been in the oven, out of the oven, back in the oven. I think it's ready to go." <laughs> So a uh, little, little humor there from uh, Nick Saban, you know, but, uh, um, you know, what, what, what about, uh, you know, the, uh, I don't know. How, how do you, how do you assess when, the, is, how do you assess when a cake's is, ready? I don't know. You know, my mother always used to take a toothpick. And stuff yeah, it's a toothpick. There. It's a toothpick yeah. test. So who's, who's got a toothpick? Um, I don't know. Yeah. Who, who are they stabbing with the toothpick? Uh, I think the cake is the quarterback, but. Um, I don't know, Lars, if 10 years ago, I'm not sure you would see a playfulness in Nick Saban, given the situation he's in. <laughs> yeah, especially, especially the kind of, uh, you know, the gravity of the moment here for, yeah, for him. Yeah, he starts and, talking and about the... his grandma's cakes, you know. <laughs> like, he wouldn't have done that a long time ago. Um, yeah. But I, I think there is a softer side to Nick Saban. Um but I, I don't think that that softer side, we may see that from a podium, but I don't think you're seeing that in practice. Not that they were privileged enough to watch it, but um, I'll bet he's in there with both feet this week. And literally the times I've been out there to watch practice, he's heavily involved everywhere. So I'll bet more so, as you said earlier in the show, he is really going to have his hands in more than just the defensive backs and defensive schemes um, he's going to be looking at that offense a lot, too. Absolutely. I think he is uh, going to be spending extra time with, with Tommy Reese and and make sure that uh, that this is an offense like we've been talking about all day uh, that is really going to be tailored to the strengths of Jalen Milrow. And you try to, to 
not put him in positions where he has to do things that he's not comfortable doing. And so um, I think we're just going to see a, a completely different approach. I mean, I know you can't obviously change what you, who you fundamentally are in a matter of three practices, but you can change the approach and, and have the long discussions with Jalen about what plays is he most comfortable running? What, uh, what does he like? What, what has he seen? And when he analyzes the film of Ole Miss defense, where does he think it can be exploited uh, given the down distance, uh, time on the clock, uh, where you are on the field? There's, there's a lot of uh, information, again, that has to be uh, uh, digested, analyzed, and then you got to spit out the answer in a very short amount of time from, uh, you know, it's not just snap to whistle, but it's as you're approaching the line of scrimmage, you look at what you are, uh, you look at the, how the Ole Miss defense is lined up and, uh, and then, you know, make the, the, the appropriate decisions. And, uh, and I, I think they just kind of need to simplify things. They need to give him some easy, early, quick completions, build that confidence back up, and just emphasize, uh, just emphasize over and over and over the need to take care of the ball, and and go back to kind of the old style Nick Saban philosophy that uh, any possession that in any offensive possession that ends with a kick is a good possession, and uh, and, and and honestly, I I think to the does okay. Let me ask you this. I was just going to say something very obvious. Like whoever wins a turnover battle in this game, I think is going to win the game. But if you think this, if 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 uh, if those two interceptions that Jalen threw against Texas end up being incompletions, do you think Alabama wins the game? No, I don't think so. I really don't. They made too many uh, mistakes. Well, they had two scores called back, didn't they? Cut total of ten points. Uh, yeah. They um, they. You know, committed penalties in just crucial situations. But um, I understand the question, and I can understand why people would go the other way. But I don't think any of that stops Alabama getting whipped at the line of scrimmage both sides. Yeah, um, there's that. <laughs> yes, there is that. <laughs> um, so we'll have to see. I mean, a lot of things didn't go Alabama's way in that game. They, they really didn't catch any breaks. But, uh, yeah, I, I mean, again, uh, I'll ask you, right out of the gate, what are you hoping to see on the offensive side of the ball from Alabama? On the offensive side of the ball. Because right out of the gate, if I had my wish, Alabama win the toss and defer. So we would yes. uh, see what uh, agreed. Alabama could handle Ole Miss. But uh, on offense, yeah, let's say they get the ball at the 25-yard line. I'd like to see uh, Monroe, uh, you know, come back, start to his right, you know, as an RPO. Um, you've got, you know, I don't know who the trailer's going to be. Uh, maybe Roy Dell or maybe um, Jace. I don't know. Um, still want to know where Haynes is. But um, And I, I would like to see them come out and, and run the offense that he is best suited for, plain and simple. And how about on the defensive side of the ball? I'd like to see a pick six. I said that a little while ago. Um, Kool-Aid or um, more, uh, just picks an errant dart, an errant dart and uh, takes it to the house right there early, like uh, Takes it 35 yards. Right what was in, uh, in, in the Texas game? What was most alarming to you about the Alabama defense? Uh, the only thing uh, really alarming was the fact that uh, offensively Texas held the, the line at bay. Yeah, it did seem though, Lars, a few times um, there was confusion in the secondary because a couple of the Texas receivers were wide open, and they did. They here's another part. They did get deep. But, and I know that South Florida is not anywhere near Texas, it appeared that they had most of those problems solved. But uh, then again, Ole Miss is not the Bulls. 
So we'll see how they handle that because Ole Miss can move the football. This is going to be a much better offense. Here's one for you. Whose offense is better, Ole Misses or Texas? Oh, Texas. <laughs> Texas. So Alabama held them to 34. So you think uh, they can hell like an old Ole Miss to 24? <sighs> That's a good question. Yeah, I do. I do. And I think uh, because yeah, I, I think those that that, that that wide receiver group for Texas is just unbelievable. <laughs> wow, unbelievable. And and Quinn Ewers, I, I know that, that that people don't have him as the as the top quarterback uh, in the draft. But if if he plays like he did against Alabama, I, I'm taking that guy number one overall. He just looks like a a <laughs> a 12 year starter in the NFL. I mean, man. He just played phenomenal. He uh, played phenomenal I, against still, Alabama. I said this yesterday. I'm still very impressed with Penix. Um, man, God, that guy is a lot of fun. And I'm talking about the Washington, the Huskies. Yeah, guy, right? the, 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 the lefty. He, yeah, Have he's, you got he's, a final he, thought or so as we wrap to the top of the hour? Keep the faith. That's what I tell all the Nebraska fans. So uh, Alabama fans, keep the faith. Keep the faith. Believe in Nick Saban and Nick we trust. Have you ever seen this lack of belief? I have not. I have I think not. I it will be, this will be the topic next week or worse. I'm asking for a prediction, Lars. Come I, on at I, it. I, 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 I think Alabama is going to come out and surprise us and play really well. I do. Um, I think Steve Irvine uh, made a great point made a great point that perhaps what happened on Saturday in South Florida may have been the greatest thing that could have happened to this team. Yeah, by not playing well, but finding a way to win. And then Monday announcing that uh, Milrow is going to be the guy. Yep. Um, we'll see. Uh, but I certainly understand those that think maybe not because of the way Alabama's played the past two weekends. Do you we'll ever bet against we'll- Nick Saban? No, no, I, no. I mean, me neither. I, and I don't think he's sliding. Uh, I think just some situation has put put itself in front of him. Alabama is going to rebound. Of course, I'm a I'm a crimson colored glass guy. So anyway, all right, Lars, have a great afternoon. Thank you, Justin. We'll do this again tomorrow. We'll be back in 22 hours on Big Noon Sports, presented by Haley Sensing Union Home Mortgage. Laura Lee Thompson is known